Thank you, uh, Senator Ernst. Senator Gillibrand, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Stant and um, Ms. Masico, public reporting shows that the Chinese government is considering providing lethal support for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. How does a hollowed out Russian army affect China's security posture? And what opportunities does the PRC government see in providing lethal support to Russia? Maybe I'll start with part of it. Thank you, Senator. Um, I think we have to understand that the Chinese do not want Russia to lose this war. You know, Xi Jinping and Putin say extravagant things about each other, they're each other's best friends, but when it comes down to the bottom line, from the Chinese point of view, Russia is the other major authoritarian country in the world that shares their grievances against the West. Uh, they both of them talk about a post-West order. In other words, they need Russia as, as a partner in trying to change the way that the world works and make it more safe, really, for autocracy. Um, and they may be uh, very surprised and maybe even appalled by the performance of the Russian military. Um, but they, but w now that it looks that you know Russia is really quite bogged down, they do not want Russia uh, to lose this war because their concern is. And it's very hard for us to imagine that. But if somebody were to come after Vladimir Putin, who would rethink what Russia is doing, rethink uh, its ties, its antagonistic ties to the West, rethink its aggressive policies, and rethink its dependence on China, then from the Chinese point of view, that would leave them alone. Again, hard for us to understand. So I think that even though up until now the Chinese have been fairly restrained in what they've done materially for Russia, even though they support rhetorically everything that's uh, the, r r the Russian narrative, um, they certainly would not want to see Russia lose. And um, you know, it remains to be seen whether they're willing to take the risk of supplying um, as we hear, possibly artillery and drones. I, I don't have much to add to that other than, again, from a, they might be able to provide a short-term stopgap for the Russians and provide some type of, you know, artillery rounds or drones, but I, I agree with Dr. Stent. Uh, Dr. Stent, have the events in the past year led you to revise any conclusions you made in your 1990 book, 1919 book, sorry, 2019 book, Putin's World? What are the biggest changes? So um, I, last week, an updated version of the book came out with a chapter on the Russia-Ukraine war. So obviously, in that book, I certainly um, understood the tensions between Russia and Ukraine. But I think I, like many people, didn't believe that Putin would undertake a full-scale invasion of Ukraine um, the way he did. So I think what it's led me to rethink is I had always viewed Putin as someone who um, was a pretty smart tactician and not a huge risk taker. So in 2008, when Russia invaded Georgia, it didn't go to the capital, Tbilisi, and, and take out President Saakashvili, whom, of course, President Putin hated. It stopped and just recognized these two uh, areas of Georgia as being independent. And even in 2014, um, it took over Crimea fairly bloodlessly, and, and it didn't uh, prosecute, continue prosecuting the war in the Donbass. It started the war. And so I think what's changed is uh, the amount of risk that Putin is willing to take. He was obviously woefully misinformed about the performance of his own military and about the performance of the Ukrainian military. Um, and so I think we see someone who um, is so hell-bent on reestablishing what he thinks is Russia's rightful empire uh, that he is... Um, He's not listening to, I think, the counsel of anyone else. So I think it's the, the willingness to take risks and to just dig himself in, uh, and, and which I think has, um, has made me somewhat change my evaluation of him. Do you have anything to, um, with regard to um, the General Assembly, um, they voted overwhelmingly last week to condemn Russia's invasion, but there were 32 abstentions. Russia has been aggressively spreading misinformation, not just in Russia and the homeland, but also in Africa and Latin America regarding the causes of the war, who's at fault for grain and fertilizer shortages and similar topics. How can the United States and their allies counter these Russian diplomatic efforts? Uh, both for Dr. Stett and, and So I think we do have to be more active diplomatically. I mean, we already discussed sort of information war, uh, but we do have to be more active. I mean, Russia, even during this f first year of the war, has increased its influence in Africa, um, partly through the Wagner Group, but also partly through diplomacy. We just had Sergei Lavrov in South Africa recently, and you've just had this past week a joint naval exercise between 
uh, Russia, China, and South Africa. So I think we do have to step up our diplomatic efforts um, in, in really in, in Latin America, uh, in Africa, and in the Middle East uh, to try and counter some of what Russia is doing. Thank you, Senator Gilbert. Senator Tuberville, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here today. Lieutenant uh, General, thank you for your service. 